Sabotage of Black Culture, Final Episode, Part 3. In Sabotage Part 3, we will focus on the sabotage of black culture in California and self-hate in Michigan and in Los Angeles. In 1842, Alan Allensworth was born into slavery in Kentucky. He was the youngest of 13 children, and as a slave, he was assigned to help his master's young boy. However, when it was discovered that he was secretly learning how to read and write, Alan Allensworth was thrown in the fields. During the American Civil War, Allensworth was sold to a horse trainer named Fred Scruggs. During a racing event in Louisville, he was able to disguise himself and escape by joining the 44th Illinois Volunteers as a Union soldier. He expressed to the soldiers about his urge to become a free man. The soldiers loaned Allen a Union coat and he covered his face with mud to appeal paler. He joined them and got out of town without detection, ending his time as a slave. In 1877, Allensworth married Josephine Level, who was also born in Kentucky. They met while studying at Roger Williams University in Nashville, Tennessee. She was also a teacher and an accomplished musician. Alan Allensworth was an ordained Baptist minister, teacher, and he led numerous churches. He became a chaplain in the U.S. Army. He became the first African American to reach the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He served for 20 years and retired in 1906. In 1908, Alan Allensworth and a group of black men purchased 20 acres of land from the Pacific Farming Company in Salito, 30 miles north of Bakersfield, with the goal of establishing a town for black soldiers and black people that had problems renting or buying land. As you can see from the map, the land was about 30 miles north of Bakersfield. The town had two general stores, a post office, a school, and eventually a library. The streets were named for African American leaders such as Soldier of Truth and Frederick Douglass, and the families that settled there created a real sense of community through creation of many organizations, including a sewing circle, a theater group, a girls' choir, and a campfire for girls' chapter. Between 1912 and 1915, newspapers started reporting this thriving and self-sufficient black-owned town. By 1914, Allensworth and his wife developed their own school, which became the first black school district in California. Also in 1914, city leaders proposed to establish a vocational educational school based on the Tuskegee Institute model and the ideas of its founder, Booker T. Washington. Although it received support for a state funding appropriation from Fresno and Tulare County representatives in the California State and Assembly, their proposal was defeated by the entire state legislature. This same year, September 14th of 1914, as Alan Allensworth was visiting Monrovia for a lecture, he was struck by two young white guys driving a motorcycle recklessly. Colonel Allensworth died from his injuries. In this same year, 1914, to add insult to injury, the Santa Fe Railroad Station moved its stop from Allensworth. This move stopped the business traffic needed to keep the town thriving. And despite the loss of their spiritual leader, the town continued to build. By 1920, 300 residents lived in Allensworth and they seemed to be picking up the pieces until the Pacific Water Company refused to allow Allensworth the additional wells they were promised to sustain the town's need for general use in farming. Once the water and the railroad left, so did the people. Allensworth 
became a ghost town. And in 1973, the state acquired the property and the Department of Parks and Recreation approved plans to develop it. And on October 6, 1976, Allersworth was dedicated as a state historical park and landmark. And on March 10th, 2018, Monrovia had a dedication to Colonel Allen Allensworth. In 1912, Charles and Willa Bruce bought beachfront property located at 26th Street in Highland in Manhattan Beach, California. They established a resort which had a popular lodge, cafe, dance hall, changing rooms, and showers. Bruce's Beach was a blessing to black people. At the time, most beaches in California were restricted for black people. By 1920, the Bruce family began experiencing elevated racism from their neighbors. Racists began slashing tires of those who patronized their businesses, intimidating and harassing them. And in 1924, Bruce's Beach was seized by the local government by the method of eminent domain. A park was supposed to be needed. The lot in question remained vacant for over 40 years before a park was built in 1960. On July 20th, 2022, the Bruce's family is handed the deed to Bruce's Beach returning the property that was taken away from them nearly a hundred years ago. The Bruce family celebrate a great victory. Six months later, the Bruce's family agreed to sell rare beachfront property back to the county for $20 million. And our next town is exactly five miles east. Formerly Gordon Manor, it is now El Camino College, Alondra Park, and the golf course in the South Bay in Los Angeles County. In 1925, Dr. Wilbert C. Gordon, who led a medical practice in Ohio, purchased land that is now El Camino College, Alondra Park, and the golf course, along with a black real estate developer and contractor. The black middle upper class neighborhood was being designed for a thousand homes. And by March of 1926, Dr. Gordon announced in the paper that he sold more than 200,000 worth of property in the upcoming development. And in 1926, according to historian Allison Rose Jefferson, a group of wealthy white people living in Palos Verdes estates had convinced the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles to condemn the subdivision land and create a park. This was done through eminent domain. However, the land stayed vacant for 20 years before a park was built. In 1946, a laundry park was built. In 1947, El Camino College was built. And in 1950, the golf course was built. Black owned Pacific Beach Club, Huntington Beach, California, 1925. Memorial Day, May 1925, the Pacific Beach Club had a beauty contest with the most beautiful women throughout Los Angeles and Orange County. There were six to 10,000 people present. The grand opening was set for Abraham Lincoln's birthday on February 12, 1926. A completed Pacific Beach Club would have included a dance pavilion for 1,500 guests, a restaurant for 700, a grocery store, a drug store, and a 20-unit city. And these were the three winners of the Pacific Beach Club beauty contest on Memorial Day of 1925. And on January 21st, 1926, at about 6 a.m., the Black Pacific Beach Club was set on fire and burned to the ground. 
This was approximately five weeks before the scheduled grand opening was supposed to be on Lincoln's birthday on February 12th, 1926. And today, the former black owned beach club is now Cabrillo Seafront Village. It's about a quarter mile south of Pacific Coast Highway and Beach Boulevard in Huntington Beach. Black Eden, also known as Idlewild, is an unincorporated community in Yates Township in Michigan's Northwestern Lower Peninsula. It was a thriving black resort town known as Black Eden. During the Jim Crow era, blacks were restricted from most hotels and resorts, so they created their own. Black residents and landowners included the one and only Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, which is the one who performed the first successful open heart surgery in America, and also Madam C.J. Walker, the first African-American self-made millionaire. During the 1950s and 60s, Black Eaton became one of the entertainment hubs of the nation, pulling in 25,000 guests a weekend, hosting mega stars like Jackie Wilson, Temptations, and Della Reese. After the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, Blacks could go to any hotel or resort they wanted. So they deserted Black Eden to lodge at hotels that once banned them and watch Black Eden fall to a ghost town. Therefore, African Americans start patronizing and lodging at resorts and hotels that did not want them, but now they will accept their money while deserting their own black owned resorts and hotels, putting them out of business. After the lack of support of the resort, Black Eden or Idlewild became a ghost town. And this is Black Eden, a.k.a. Idlewild, in Michigan on a map. The Fillmore District, San Francisco, California. In the 1940s, many African Americans moved to San Francisco's Fillmore District. They worked on military contract positions during World War II. Fillmore was a vibrant community of black people, many enjoying home ownership and successful businesses. Booker T. Washington Hotel was the most popular space in the Fillmore District. Many celebrities such as Ella Fitzgerald, Lou Rawls, Donna Washington, James Brown, Duke Ellington, Nat King Cole, Bobby Blue Bland, and many others not only stayed there, but they also performed in the area. Justin Herman is hired as executive director for San Francisco's redevelopment agency. The plan is to displace 20,000 people, mainly African Americans from the Fillmore area in two different phases. Phase one, 4,000 people will be displaced and phase two, 13,000 people will be replaced. Justin Herman received extreme pushback after displacing 4,000 residents in A1. Therefore, for A2, he hired a black man, Bishop Wilbur Hamilton, to replace and displace 13,000 more African American residents. Justin Herman's first test for Bishop Wilbur Hamilton is to test his loyalty by agreeing to tear down his father's church. So what happened to the once vibrant black community of Fillmore? Well, a six lane highway is put through the middle of the black community of Fillmore. Over 20,000 people will be displaced via eminent domain. And what happened to the most popular Booker T. Washington Hotel? Well, it is now a safe way. The iconic Ebony Showcase Theater. In 1965, the Ebony Showcase Theater was founded by Nick and Edna Stewart. 
The goal of the theater was to give African Americans the ability to play roles other than the traditional stereotypes. For over 40 years, numerous performances lit up the stage at the Ebony Showcase Theater. It truly gave the black community something they can call their own. In 1998, under the leadership of Councilman Nate Holden, the Ebony Showcase Theater was seized via eminent domain. There was no public hearing and it was demolished in one day. December 11th, the year 2000, Nate Holden and Mayor Richard Reardon congratulate each other on demolishing the Ebony Showcase Theater and promising to rebuild another. As you can see, Nick Stewart in the picture with the Ebony ripoff picture, because yes it is, generational wealth was lost by taking the Ebony Showcase Theater and turning it over to the city. The Merck Park was built in the 1920s and was named after its developer. Today, the Merck Park is known as the cultural hub of the black community. The Merck Park has hosted Dr. King celebrations, Malcolm X celebrations, coming home celebrations for John Jijaga, protests against police brutality, Marcus Garvey unity rallies, and unreal drumming circle. In approximately 2017, the Merck Park allowed tent cities to reside in the park. This gave a reason to lock up the park, change the landscape to a dog park with benches and small trees. And today, a community park now looks like a dog park with an animal gate. And don't be fooled folks, as you can see, it is an animal gate. And street vendors were restricted from setting up in the park, but now are allowed to set up directly in front of stores, many times selling some of the same products as those stores, sabotaging those businesses that are paying leases and mortgages. And newly elected councilwoman Heather Hutt has got her hands full to clean up this Lamert Park mess. The Marathon. Hermius Ashkadon, a.k.a. Nipsey Hussle, Black Sam and family, brought black business to the corner, giving black young folks an opportunity. What is wrong with us having something nice? Save the FIBA Center. The FIBA Center has been a African-centered cultural center for the last 20 years. It was the old site of Fire Station 54. Jabari Jamani wrote a grant and turned it into a culture center. And the Afiba Center stands for the African Firefighters and Benevolent Association. Jabari Jamani, fireman for over 30 years, he hosted a variety of services that were great for the community. Education where four to six graders were being taught advanced algebra, trigonometry, calculus, reading and comprehension. Health education, where holistic and medical doctors were giving health information. CMOTAP, where our image was being guarded. Joko Collective critically evaluated particular movies, and lawyers actually gave free legal education. And this is one of the many beautiful murals that were painted inside the Ophiba Center. Approximately 2018, Marquise Dawson starts attending multicultural focus groups on what the Afiba Center should be used for. Why was there a need for a focus group to see what the Afiba Center should be used for? There was already great things going on there. The oldest holistic doctor and iridologist in Los Angeles, Dr. Paul Goss, blessed the Afiba Center with educational lectures. One of his students, Dr. Rao, along with Tibidi Omoja, blessed the center with free health classes once a month. And also, chef, author, and organic gardener, Kiti Awadu, also blessed the center whenever he was in town. And Dr. Rosie Milligan, world-renowned author, activist, and founder of the Black Writers on Tour, had blessed the center many times with their educational workshops. Also, chiropractor and health researcher Dr. Kerry Pratt has conducted numerous workshops on chiropractic health as well as women's health. And registered dietitian Brandy Nicholson conducted many workshops on proper nutrition and herbal health. And our late elder, Anuka Rashidi, 
gave numerous Afiba Center history lessons on the African origins throughout the world, and Professor Griff had conducted workshops on mind control in the music industry, and Dr. Umar spoke to young parents about getting their children to avoid the school to prison pipeline. An engineer, Kwabana Rosuli, educated the community of the toxic music that is being pushed in the black community. And also Dr. Romeo Brooks, the founder of Roots Nutrition, gave us jump rope competitions every month and also gave us health lectures on body intelligence. Also Impu taught us yoga and Tai Chi. And also we had Patrick Pratt, AKA Straw, who gave us some conscious comedy to make us think. Perusha Hickson came to the FIBA Center many times and brought his positive spirit, leading the whole center in group yoga. Adrian Bosley brought us health education as well as poetry and spoken words. And April Sims blessed us with her presence and education in areas of marketing, business management, and juicing, which she does a lot of these days, being the owner of April's Life in a Bottle. And as you can see from the numerous flyers, there were many things going on for the last 20 years at the Afiba Center. It was a place that we called home where we can speak from our own perspective and it was organic. And the Afiba Center had an excellent math and reading camp teaching four through eighth graders advanced algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. And without Marquise Dawson ever stepping a foot into the FIBA Center to see the various programs that were going on, without attending one function, without stepping his foot into the center, he serves the FIBA Center with an eviction. Right after the eviction, Community members storm city council voicing their opinion only to be ignored by city council members texting, getting coffee, or simply ignoring them. And to add insult to injury, the TV monitor showed the council members as giants and the community members as ants. And Marquise Dawson didn't even show up. Where was he? Where was he? He was at the Black Caucus in D.C. doing a workshop on fighting off gentrification. At the same time, evicting a Black culture center that's been in Los Angeles for 20 years. Some would say that's like a bank robber teaching you how to invest your money. These three people, many feel, helped close the Afiba Center, a cultural center in Los Angeles for over 20 years. The day after members went to City Hall protesting the eviction, Najee Ali writes an article in the Wave newspaper insinuating that black folks weren't taking care of the building and weren't following rules. The next day, radio host Dominique De Prima repeats these same lies on the air for thousands to hear without fact checking. And in the midst of the pandemic, Councilman Marquise Dawson locks up the Afiba Center so no one could enter. And Councilman Marquise Dawson puts in a motion to remove the Afiba Center and replace it with Community Build, an organization that already has two other locations, and removing a 20-year-old organic Black Culture Center. And the following weekend, many of FIBA Center members went to Community Build's large location in Lamert Park to protest the takeover. And these two sisters, Denise Woods and Tara Perry, ran against Marquise Dawson in 2020 for District 8. However, they were told they didn't have enough signatures to be on the ballot, so Marquise Dawson was the only box to check. And Councilman Marquise Dawson, instead of going to Brother Jabari and saying, all of these good things that you're doing, how can I help? But instead, he decides 
to replace it without knowing what's going on. Can black folks have anything of our own? And speaking of having something of our own, black folks had the money to purchase in the heart of LA, the Crenshaw Mall on Crenshaw and Margaret King Boulevard. However, Councilman Marquise Dawson authorized the sale of the Crenshaw Mall to an investor, a white developer in Beverly Hills. And if black lives really matter, why are train platforms put above ground in white neighborhoods, but are put on ground level in black neighborhoods, creating more traffic and safety hazards? And is slick talking Alderman Davis from Good Times still around today? Just a different name but the same game. And semi-quoting Dr. Umar Johnson and Dr. Rosie Milligan, we blindly give away our vote with no conditions. Complain why the person we help elect doesn't do anything for us, and African Americans are continuing to chant the slogan, vote blue, don't matter who, and wonder why we are not respected. The next two minute clip exposes the same tactics used to get the black vote. And then to know that uh, Reverend Al Green was here. I so in love with you. And we have to understand that today, the tactics have changed. Instead of racist whites inflicting pain on us, they have hired sellout Negroes to do their job. Let's stay black and strong. The purpose of this production was to expose the many black accomplishments that have been destroyed and merely forgotten. We need to learn how the destructive tactics used then are still being used today so we can expose and combat them. And lastly, we must learn how our ancestors achieved these great accomplishments so we can duplicate their success. I appreciate everyone that watched all three episodes of Sabotage of Black Culture. Let's educate and liberate. One love.